Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Zenitsu, and you're listening to the DigiTalks podcast, the show that covers various topics from news to meta developments and everything in between for the fine folks who love the Digimon trading card game. Just as a quick reminder, I do stream this live over on twitch.tv slash Zenitsu, and it's also uploaded uh, as a video on the YouTube channel of Zenitsu, as well as being on various podcasting platforms like Spotify for your viewing and listening pleasure. Please feel free to leave a rating, like, follow, subscribe, uh, and review, depending on the platform you're listening on, if you want to help support the podcast. Today, I'm back with my co-host, Teddy, and we're going to be talking about BT15 and the current state of the secondary market one week out from its launch, and our overall thoughts and opinions on the set after playing around a little bit with it and experiencing some of the cards and the, uh, I guess, a little bit of the meta. So, Teddy, uh, why don't you take it away with uh, the question of the week? Uh, since we're talking about the market a bit in this video, my question of the week is as follows. What cards surprised you in terms of its value, either higher or lower? Uh, give me your thoughts down in the comment. I'm down to see. Uh, I'm interested to see what you guys think. Uh, yeah, so my I guess like everyone kind of knew. Apocaly was going to be the the butt secret rare is uh I'll <laughs> I'll say it and I knew he was going to be low and I knew how low secret rares can go but I think him being $3 and like 50 cents I think that's a fine price for the butt secret rare but I think at the end of the day he's probably going to end up being a dollar like We've had dollars. We've had dollar secrets. Right now, he's not quite there. So that's the part that kind of is shocking me is the fact that he's not exactly there. I think it'll take some time for him to get there, but just because you only need one of it, and there's probably just way too many of him being floating around, and his limitation really killing any drive for people wanting to play the Dark Masters deck, even though that deck is kind of broken because of Apocalypse. Uh, he's rightly justified to get limited, but in terms of secondary market, I uh, I definitely overspent on him, and let's just say I didn't even spend... I, I spent more than $3.50. So I did like a whole little breakdown on how much I kind of lost this set in terms of when I bought them day one and uh, what they currently are now, just as part of the experiment. But we'll go over that later. What's a, what's a card that you're surprised by, Teddy? In all honesty, a card that I'm quite surprised that it's not higher in value is Gatomon, to be honest. Like, with the amount of hype surrounding Yellow Vaccine, I'm quite surprised that the card isn't higher value, to be honest. Um, it does quite a bit for how easy it is to cheap it is to use in the decks so that's it that you can use it in so i'm i think that's the biggest card that surprises me aside from like uh like mega kabuteri mon ace being so cheap uh that card also kind of does like a lot of the cards are a lot cheaper than i would have anticipated for the pull rates being really really bad like we've seen how bad pull rates can affect card prices before We've had a couple of sets and even some promos that do that, where it's just like, look at Raremon from EX5, or like the box topper promo Raremon from EX5. Because that card is so highly sought after and borderline impossible to pull, because of the whole one in six chance out of a box, no one's realistically going to be opening up boxes just to try to hunt him down. As like the chase card for that, for EX5, uh, his price just climbed through the roof and like i get that raremon is supposedly the the second coming of eismon scatter mode but i think like people are over hyping and overestimating that card i've seen a lot of people like look at him for leviamon and i'm just like are you crazy like leviamon doesn't need this card at all he's not trying to hardcore turbo cycle to fill up his trash he's just trying to get basically a one two thing set up and 
he's a little overkill on top of his slight anti-synergy with the deck. But I digress. Like, the secondary market has been kind of going absolutely crazy since BT14. And, like, in the good ways and not good ways at the same time, you know? It's a constant back and forth, for sure, I think. Uh, right now, we're kind of trending good, for the most part. Uh, but, like, I mean, we could look at last set. Last set was kind of bad. I guess it's good in one way and then good in some ways. Uh, bad in some ways, because the promos are really bad right now. But I don't think that's necessarily the set's fault. No. Uh, some of the promos kind of calmed down <clears throat> to be where they reasonably should be or where I would expect them. And then other cards are just, like, through the roof for, like, zero reason. And it's not even just specifically promo cards. Like, we saw... um a lot of buyouts happen, and some cards are rebounding from the buyouts. Some cards just straight up aren't because people, after the initial wave of, like, the first month people are opening up boxes, people kind of just stop opening up boxes. That's kind of, like, one of the trends that I noticed being an active participant in the secondary market is, like, oh, yeah. things just stop being opened and then disappear and then that's where we get to certain things being stupid like uh heavy leoman that card is nowhere near eight dollars uh it was bought out at around the two dollar range which was where i was looking to get more um but i lost the opportunity because it got bought out and people aren't opening up ex5 because again it's it created this kind of toxic side of the secondary market where it's like it's not safe to open up this box so people just aren't going to open it up because it's not safe i mean yeah why would they why would you open it and then just screw yourself in terms of value it makes from a buyer standpoint it makes sense yeah bt14 uh, is definitely a lot healthier of a set i mm -hmm. will have to say <clears throat> Because BT14, you're guaranteed the box topper, um, the training cards. And that's easily 30 plus value right there before you even open anything from the box itself. So I think like boxes were going for around 70, which I think is a fine price. Because if you hit some good alt arts on top of the promos, even though I think like the only promo that's anywhere remotely worth opening for is uh saber Dramon. or no not saber Dramon. um what was the good one from bt14 is it not saber Dramon? no it might have been saber Dramon. yeah yeah, yeah. It? no it was saber Dramon. so everybody was hyping it for anubis and uh purple decks in general yeah either way there was like one out of the six promos that was actually worth opening for um from bt14 and i mean are still holding good value like Seedramon is still like 13 14 dollars yeah um uh, oh no 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 uh, like 20 bucks. i i'm i'm totally misremembering it was uh shadramon diaboramon skull nightmon morphamon yeah the uh night, rust guys. tyranomon ace and yeah. nightmon like a lot of those cards are still holding value so like you look at the promo the um the training cards and you look at the majority of those promos being above $10. And that's still like $40 <clears throat> guaranteed before you even get to opening any actual cards. Yeah, so, exactly. Like, that's what yeah. makes BT14 still worth it. And BT14, as a set, is still just a very fire set. Like, that set is a very solid one because you have one of the best staple cards in the entire game for yellow in the form of Patamon. Uh, then I know a lot of people are super hyped well. on D Police with Commandramon and mm -hmm. Palmon and uh, the rookies Zudo from that Ace. set are just so absurdly good. Like almost literally all the rookies from that set are just awesome. Like I think literally every one of them. Gomo is probably the quote unquote worst one, but like even he's still very good in the decks that he's used in. Yeah, and it kind of puts bt15 in a really bad spot because if you look at a lot of the cards that are just in the set in terms of what decks would be popular and what's going to be the the next big thing there's really not anything i can solidly point to it's just like bugs isn't going to be there yet bugs will no. be there 
thanks to BT-16, not BT-15. Uh, Yellow yeah. Vaccines has so many different variations that Garoman is just only in one of, like, the eight different ways you could play the deck. Uh, Bioman is mid, just straight up mid. It's good for the Birds deck, but the Birds deck didn't really put up any huge results in Japan. Megijerman is fine. Again, a card just hasn't really put up any results. And then all of the LM cards are basically, they're playable, but their decks just aren't. Gamamon, I think, is the only good deck that's left. And quote unquote good. Yeah, and he's already outdated in terms of how well he could have performed. So, like, and even the aces, um, a lot of the aces are just straight up weaker too. So yeah. that I mean, even besides Andromon. Yeah, like Andromon's the Andrew best Mon. ace. Uh Myotismon is kind of a mid ace. Like it's a cool card. But it's just compared to a lot of the other aces, just not doing a lot. So, like, it really... And the fact that the set's watered down in terms of secret, supers and secrets because of the increased really makes pulling them harder, but they're not desirable to begin with, which is what we're currently seeing. A hundred percent agree. Like, think about it. You open this set, and you pull a Myotis mod. Are you like, wow, this is exactly what I needed for my deck? <laughs> like, what deck are you using him in at the current moment that isn't like a Myotis Mon based deck? I guess you could theoretically use him in just about any purple deck, but like, why? Like, what, what is he doing that you can't already do or do better in other ways? So it's like, there, there's a bunch of cards like that, I feel like, in this set, excluding a few outlier cards. Um... Because even, in all honesty, the super rares are like, eh, in this set. But a lot of the uncommons and uncommons to me are like winners in this set. This set, I think like the, like Monzemon X, um, uh, Togemon, like the, the whole Palmon line, Garurumon the, from low end to um, higher end, Waru Seijermon. There's a bunch of like just extremely solid cards. Betamon, the one that gets jamming, like... It's funny that, like, I care more about the cards that are building forward decks than the actual, like, big hits you kind of want from this set. Because, like, a lot of these cards, like Omekamon, thinks another card. Like, there's a Magnadramon, who's, like, <laughs> just a rare. Like, there's so many, so many good cards that are not, like, the sought-after, quote-unquote, super rares, secret rares, and junk like that. So it's very interesting to see that, like, I would rather pull a lot of these, like, uncommon and rares and stuff rather than the super rares. Which I think is a lot of people's sentiment. And when it comes to the low rarity cards, <clears throat> like, I've opened uh, basically the equivalent of three boxes. And I I opened two for a video and kind of just showed, like, hey, yeah, um it's still going to be super easy to pull anything low rarity. Like the, the low mm -hmm. rarity pull rates really haven't changed a whole lot, even though there was more. It just means that you will see less repeated overflow. So you'll yeah. still see like your, what you're expecting, but you just won't see as many, but that again, because there's so many of them, it just doesn't change the value of what they are, even though they're like maybe five percent harder to pull on. Like Yeah, like if you pull if you open three boxes, you're probably gonna have a playset of just about all the commons, uncommons, maybe some of the rares for the most part. Like I that's what I did. I, I opened only three and I basically have every I well no, not basically, I have everything I need from low rarity and below. I have on all without having to go extra for the market like yeah, go into we, the secondary market and we did see a little bit of attempted market <clears throat> manipulation at the beginning like yeah. <laughs> leviamon x and gabumon x were bought out like probably on day one day two of the secondary market opening the floodgates to everyone and then it was like day two yeah and then as we can see now unfortunately gabumon is uh a byproduct of the buyout but because his price isn't dropping at all uh 
and he has good reason to not fall, but he also has good reason to fall. I would have expected him to be like that solid $5 super rare, but instead he's holding on to that 10 because of that bought out because it's harder for a card to fall in price when a card is bought out because now everyone is like the the floor or yeah, the floor is reset to a different price. So mm -hmm. Leviathan did get bought out. He was almost $20 at one point. And then right now the market it's like 10 miraculous, bucks now. Yeah, like miraculously uh there was enough Healed of them to set his price back down to the 10 that he was on like day 1. Thank God. I mean, I didn't buy I, I didn't pay more than that, but no, um, that's good for players that want to play it. I do think he's probably if not the best card in the set. Um, aside from Apocalypse Mon at max power, but <clears throat> like Leviathan X is just so absurd. So his <laughs> price being the where it is is I hundred percent knew it was going to be higher than the normal SRs than the rest of them. I think like uh, that's just where the hype is as a deck because he was using the Garurumon package. A lot of people were just kind of questioning what the heck to do with him, and like we already know he becomes a little bit better by um by bt16 because a lot of his cards get x forms and that kind of helps round out the deck a little bit better but according to the japanese results and again japan plays the, to their own drum mm -hmm. but he didn't put up insane results i think people are just really high on him because he compared to everything else he is kind of just a little bit more sought after like if you want to build his deck you need that card um exactly you cannot like he's there's no substitute or anything of that for leviathan x because of how absurd he is yeah and unfortunately <clears throat> i think the secret rares secret rares are usually pretty hard to predict what they're gonna actually end up doing especially playable secret rares so like the fact that Metal Gururmon and Quantumon are basically holding the same price for having some pretty decent levels of usability is kind of shocking because Metal Gururmon is just a really solid card. He has at least two decks that he can go into, uh, which is mm -hmm. more than some other cards because most cards are designed for one specific deck. But the fact that Metal Gururmon can go into a couple is really, really nice. And I think the card is a strong card. It's just, I think, the anti-hype around Melga, because Melga, shockingly enough, is the most limited deck in the entire game. Um, they don't know how to print Gururumon cards. They just don't. Well, they, they don't know how to print balanced Gururumon cards. But that's, Melga, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, Metal Gururumon is, like to me, still a strong card, and he helps save the deck because of how strong he is and the versatility he could give the deck. And then obviously in like Gabu Bond, he's just a good card because anything that could warp from uh, oh, your rookies, three. which is what you're primarily playing, is just like absolutely cracked. Uh, and then Quantumon also has lots of decks that she can go into. Yes, her evolution cost is on the expensive side, but the fact that she has some of the better protections in the game and is a fairy and is in two colors and does some like absurdly good stuff like i'm i'm shocked that she's not even higher i mean um, a chaos to grade on legs like and every turn can potentially give yourself the protection i mean from a specific effect so that's pretty amazing but, yeah so, and there's a lot of cards that just synergize with her which is why i'm like surprised that it's not any higher but a lot of these cards just that's aren't the quantity though I think it is the quantity, but the weird thing is I don't necessarily know how much more common the secret rares feel this set. Because it, either that or there's just borderline no attention on them at all, uh, which is what's driving the price down is because nobody's buying them. And because everyone is trying to undercut while nobody's buying, it just helps drive the price of the, the card <clears throat> down and down. Um, so this that is might probably, be why. yeah, this is probably a good segue into, uh, one of the experiments that I had with this set. And that was, uh, I decided to buy a decent amount of cards because I only opened up 
two, two and a half boxes, technically. And I bought almost all of the rest of the cards that I didn't have. And I can say that I lost money on almost every single card from buying them day one, which usually buying them day one is where you're going to get some of the cheaper pricing because then everyone's rushing to get them, prices go up, and then the market opens a little bit more because people are now getting their product, they're opening it, they're listing and whatever. And then that's when the initial flood comes in. So like you're buying before the tidal wave. So uh, I was shocked to see how much I lost from just the tidal wave itself of people opening it up and trying to sell for the cards not to sell. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of it, but let's just say I lost pretty much close to $100 in value from all of the singles. Granted, most of the damage was from the secret rares because I bought them for like $23 a piece. And right now they're selling for about $15 a piece. And then Apocalypse I bought for 7 and he's selling for like 3 So it's like, okay, I did lose a little bit there. But a lot of the cards just lost like maybe a dollar or two in value. And some of them slightly gained in value. Gabumon I bought for like 8 and now he's like $10, 11 uh, Ryu does if I actually did buy him because there was TCG cart shenanigans where my cart magically got emptied because I was buying with a whole bunch of other people. But if I would have bought him, I would have bought him at around the $6 mark. He's currently $9. Um, Levimon I bought at like the $9 mark. He's sitting at 11 So like my increases and decreases on a lot of the super rares aren't like astronomical, but a lot of the cards did end up adding up in terms of the value being lost in terms of when I bought them compared to what they are now. See, he had, it's funny because he had that experience, but I had the basically the complete opposite. Or like, I don't know what time he bought your card or when you bought your cards, but I essentially was at like 12 p like at night like the moment the maybe a little bit after like 20 30 minutes after uh february on... 16th in either at night or in the morning <clears throat> i don't remember because i bought them the literal night of the release um so that's funny that you yeah i them... i waited a full 24 hours so from when you bought them yeah and the the experience is crazy that he had that experience but whereas for me, if I, let's say I just said, screw it, I just don't want any of these cards and sold them, I would gain. I would gain probably a good amount from selling all the cards that I bought. So You're probably in the minority, though. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it, It's very interesting to see that like that is his experience, where my experience was basically the polar opposite. Where, um, aside, I guess, Apocalypse, but I also didn't buy Apocalymon, so that would be the only card that I was just like, I don't care about, because uh, just because I have no interest. I have my copy of the card, and that's kind of where it will be. I, I Technically, I have two copies, but I don't, I have no interest in playing that deck any, even at full power, so I'm, I'm good. Uh, other than them, I bought everything else, and I, and I w would say I gained more than I lost. 100%. Um, which is weird because literally a 24 span hour of time. That's how volatile the markets can be sometimes. Yeah. And this isn't <clears throat> necessarily a pattern that's specifically Normal. just to this set because there's a, like the last couple of sets outside of BT 14 have actually been pretty toxic sets. Like in terms of secondary market, trying to not necessarily like invest in but just as a player just trying to get a good deal for the cards the set like the past couple of sets have been extremely volatile and extremely toxic and like and not in the good ways because certain cards that shouldn't be high priced are and then other cards that aren't high priced are fine like cool it's doing what it should be doing but the fact that you'll just have like random bad cards just spike in price or like not bad cards um but like just good cards that didn't have a lot of attention just spike up in price and the problem is because of how the sets are designed in terms of the pull rates 
it's not worth opening the sets just to try to chase some of those cards. Like uh, Manzeman from RB1. Like a lot of the RB1 like rares. $15 card, bro. Yes. Like, you know how insane that is? <laughs> For a rare. And that's because the rares are or scuffed. To get. Yes, the rares are scuffed because of all of the reprints. The reprints dramatically harmed the cards people actually want. And I can't, we kind of said this before, like when we were mm -hmm. uh, initially like experiencing RB1 and it just, it sucked. It just actually sucked. And we're seeing like set after set where it's just like, this is toxic because it's not worth opening, but it's not worth buying the card either. So you just let it sit in limbo. Nothing happens. And then it just looks at it. It literally becomes a stain on the market. Um, and right now, uh, like just as an example from BT15, like Ryudamon, that card is way higher than it needs to be. It's currently around $9 and that's $9 or probably about $8 more than what I would actually want to pay for the card compared to a lot of the other, uh, super rares in the set. Uh, the problem with the card isn't necessarily because the card isn't good. It's because we already know what's coming out literally one set later and that's his own replacement so people are buying up the card thinking he's going to be good now and spoiler i've been playtesting the deck he's not that great he is really overrated he's a fine card but he's very overrated uh because d brigades and digi police don't necessarily mesh that well together and he is not helping the deck in in what it needs to do I don't think it's easy. See, I kind of I'm on the opposite end where I really like the card. Um, getting your memory setter out for free and being unaffected by Digimon effects for a singular turn sometimes can just straight up win you the game. I mean, um, the problem is uh, <clears throat> D Police, like the Ryuta line, and D Police D Brigades are doing two completely different things. So, like, he's fine for what he's doing. It's just for what the deck is doing, he's counterintuitive because he's helping the wrong side of things. And then we know in BT-16, it goes back to deeper gate uh, digi-polices. So it's just like, you just throw that card out because you just have his functional replacement in uh, the next set. So you get a new Commandramon, you get a new Seastramon, you get a new... Uh, Tank Dramon. Uh you do get a new Dark Dramon, but he's not a D police, but I digress. Yeah. Like you just there is no actual reason why Ryudamon should be as highly priced as he is, because where he currently is in the meta isn't necessarily that great, especially for the deck that he's in. I think maybe in like an X antibody <clears throat> deck, he's probably better. But uh no, we a lot of people just sometimes don't know how to experiment with uh digimon deck building and like i like how they've been how they've been using certain traits to be able to have multiple different avenues at trying to build a deck uh but some people aren't necessarily exploring as deeply as they could or should and i think part of that is the like japanese meta it's just easier to look at what they did and just copy and paste and then continue marching well like the there. net deck it's like why would they make their own when someone did it already that's proven that it works i understand somewhat to the extent but i also just like building my own decks so i don't that's just me though but you it is your prerogative to do whatever you wish in regards to building decks and things like that uh there's nothing necessarily wrong with you saying well this deck did well so why would i not just play that deck nothing wrong with that i mean it makes sense if the other person did well all you have to do is learn how to do it and you could do well so i i understand that mentality um, but I do wish people would experiment a little bit more well, and try different things because I honestly love the, the line from this set for like the Digi Police because I think it's when you if you are able to establish Oriumon, like being able to basically once per turn slam another Digi Police, Digimon, suspend something and then just continuously keep being annoying is, is awesome. Like I think there's a lot of good there. Getting free tamers out if you play the Rush uh, Digi Police guy, whatever his name, Numimon. And like, there's so many interesting plays that I think you can do because of the Oriumon line from the set. Suspending, bot decking tamers, so tamer removal. 
Super solid. Does um, he bot deck tamers? I don't he think can. he can. He can bot deck. Yes, he can. He can bot deck a suspended Digimon or tamer. Um, or Yumon can do that as long as it when Digivolving. The level, the uh, should yeah, the level six. Yeah. Okay. He he's pretty awesome. Like I I think there's a lot of cool things. It, it like he alone opens the deck for a lot of different avenues, but I think people won't test it. And that's where it sucks. And well, the, he... the from from a market standpoint, he's like the fact that he is a rare, like that speaks volumes to where you are driven more towards the rares and some of the other cards than to some of the more higher rarity cards. And that's kind of like what you were saying before, which creates this like anti-drive for the set because you don't need to open as many boxes chasing the rares. Um, it's funny because and... like, I, I mean, this is a perfect example. Like for you, uh, the Oryumon and like my Otismon. Like look what this Oryumon does compared to my Otismon. Like this Oryumon is by comparison just bonkers compared to the the level like the ace the level five ace that's supposed to be a super rare and those are supposed to be the cards you want to see so it, it's really weird i don't know how i feel about that to be honest and then you get uh like i said the lm cards uh just they just really screwed everything up because their inclusion like they don't even feel good as inclusions it's nice that we got them but at the end of the day how we got them just ultimately didn't matter because we're getting them too late. They're taking up slots that reasonably shouldn't be there, ruining the pull rates of the other cards. But as we can see with the secondary market, the cards are just not desirable to begin with. Like this set is just like there's no drive to want to buy this set in comparison to others. And like it is it does just make this set one of the worst Digimon sets ever. Like I, I think over time. And this is a big, like, stretch. Over time, the cards should appreciate. Uh, I'm using the word should very loosely. And in parentheses, uh, air quotes. Uh, because as we saw with BT11, like, BT11 was another scuffed set because the campaign rares and the foil cards, uh, the foil commons and uncommons, really screwed up that set hardcore and a mm -hmm. lot of as a result a lot of the like high rarity cards actually became expensive even some of the rares became expensive but the cards became more expensive over time because uh people weren't opening up the set and the stock was slowly drying out because the cards were actually good and being used i think like we could see some of those kinds of cards in uh this set as well Tentamon being like one of the ones to watch and he's been already climbing in the secondary market because we already know that he's going to be good for bugs in BT16 so like but it's some of the other cards that might slightly appreciate like we have no idea if the new um Omnimon stuff that Japan is spoiling right now is going to even need this Gabumon at all or even the Metal Gururumon. We already know that they get a Metal Gururumon, but we don't know if that's the Metal Gururumon people are going to actually use. It probably is because it has an inheritable, but I digress. Like, there's there's so many unknowns to where something could appreciate well over time to create the value back into the set. Um, not necessarily meaning that people are going to open it on mass to try to, to get those yeah. few chases, because as we see, nobody's opening up boxes after a certain point. No, I don't the uh, I don't think they will. <laughs> um, some of these cards, of course, will I think will stay. Like I do think the Gabumon is just solid. Like I, there's a bunch of uh, well, a few cards <laughs> that I think will just no, will only go up. Like they won't go down. I don't think. I think Gabumon will be one of those because I think just a Gurumon deck in general will stay a meta contender forever. Like. The way they print these cards, like the Gurumon cards, there's no way the deck won't be good. Um, and I think we're in an aggressive meta at the moment, so of course people... Aggressive, Metal Guru, it should be fine. Um, people are playing in like Bale Starmon and stuff like that, so... it. I think this stuff is will stay good. The Tentamon stuff, of course, is just future-proofing. 
people we know the bugs are great come next set um <clears throat> and it's just like it's just good like you just make sense why would you like you're putting yourself in a better position to play decks going down the line getting these cards now instead of waiting until they're super hype and then now the cards are going to skyrocket so it it um i would behoove you if you are looking to play bugs or anything like that these cards i can only see them going up <laughs> like so maybe not the ace i don't know i feel like the ace should be a lot more expensive but eh, maybe they don't use that in the set i don't know i, I think like too many bug decks um this is where like so, certain cards can kind of just spike out of nowhere because <clears throat> like if they're not using the ace they have to be using something else and if they're using something else that's even remotely like harder to get or like that's secretive out of nowhere. yeah it's gonna make that skyrocket out of nowhere so i would behoove you i'm not telling you guys to go buy out all the crap but if you are interested <laughs> No, usually, some of these decks. usually it's better to get things sooner than later. Uh, but sometimes, as as we could see in both cases, uh, waiting can kill you, and not waiting can also kill you. So it's just it's more of like what you're comfortable with. Obviously, I was not comfortable with uh, what I spent on all of the cards to make my play sets. I spent way too much, and it did end up backfiring me. Um, because I did end up overspending, but that was uh, my fault and my own impatience. That's fair. I mean, and I mean that just happens. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Like um, not this set, but was it thirteen? No, thirteen. We got the case, so I didn't really care. Twelve. I got the case. Don't think I really had. I mean, I guess if you're counting the case, I would lose quite a bit because I'm not like overly selling. I'm just recently now starting to sell stuff but um i guess you could say quote unquote with those sets i just lost money because i we didn't didn't uh we never we didn't sell too much of it um but for the most part i didn't think i i think i'm quite oh good like happy with where i when i purchase the cards when i do there are some ones that i just was like damn i got screwed over with like um Gallant Mon from BT13. I waited too long for to get the alt art, uh, or at least the full playset of the alt art, and then I had the shotgun blow fifty dollars a piece on one, on them. So I, I had to buy two more. That sucked. But um, other than that specific card, I don't think there was that I can think of from memory that really like, because th this game is fairly cheap. To just get that out of the way now. This game is. For the most part, fairly cheap. So it, I mean, it's hard not, not according to Bandai. They're trying to figure out, like, it feels like they understand their game is cheap and they don't want it to be. So they're trying mm. some really underhanded ways to increase the price, the of, price. <laughs> of cards. And I really don't appreciate it because the community, in terms of the secondary market and how, like, things have been going, has been, like, extremely toxic, extremely volatile, and like it just it also just makes the products not even fun to open like i didn't even have fun opening bt15 granted uh apparently my two boxes being almost identical was like an anomaly but that that still can happen and it just sucks a lot of the fun away from even just wanting product uh i went and i bought more of uh bt14 just for the stupid um memory boosts like I hated the fact I hate the fact that I need the memory boosts and I hate the fact that they're almost ten dollars a piece now because they keep climbing and climbing because stock will eventually dry up, people won't be opening it anymore, and like it just it just sucks. Uh and the fact that two sets back to back, they have made specific promo cards a one in six chance to get and all of the promo cards are good for their respective decks making people want them and the fact that like they're so the hard to... are good for a bunch of decks too not just a singular deck yeah the so the okay. higher the playability usually the more the demand which <clears throat> will up the price of the card like there's sure you could say that uh skull knight mon is good for skull knights and bagra 
But those are two decks that people really aren't playing a whole lot of, and they're casual decks. So saying that you now need this like $15 card as a four of for your casual deck where the rest of the entire deck probably only costed you like pennies. <laughs> yeah. Like 20 to $30. Now your deck <clears throat> is going to jump in price to be a hundred dollar deck. It's just like, what are we doing here? Bandai? Like why, why are you, I don't, I don't quite understand what you're trying to do. Like, I think that our reception to BT 15 would have been better if sets had functions like, you know, like the inclusion of the RB cards all along. Like if the sets were just a smidge larger and those were our normal pull rates that we would have been used to, I think that one, the market definitely would have been a little bit healthier because now things wouldn't be super easy to get. And that creates that drive for people to want to open to try to sell. Um, but because we weren't used to that and because it was done so poorly, it just, it felt really bad. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think I hated opening this set. Like my first box, you know, you, you have that first box. You're like, oh man, this is going to be great. I'm going to open up my boxes. I'm going to have fun. And I opened my boxes and I was like, wow, this is horrible. Like after the second, after the first box, I was like, wow, this, this sucks. This really feels awful. I'm like, it, it just did not. It was just a horrible experience the, to open the cards. And the sad part is, this wasn't even an L for Bandai. Bandai already made their money off of this set <clears> because <throat> they had stores and the distributor pre-order months ago. They already the had people their that lose are the player base. Correct, and like they knew the reception was going to be relatively negative. And I think like right now, uh, like from a store's perspective, this really doesn't make a store want Digimon at all, which I think is a huge problem that Bandai really needs to fix like ASAP. They should want stores to want Digimon. And between this set, RB1 being a complete dumpster fire for them, uh, and uh, EX5 being mid at best. EX sets are usually pretty bad for stores. Uh, like, it just really doesn't make a store want Digimon. And that's part of my problem with this. Isn't necessarily like, oh, as a player, yeah, I spent too much money, boohoo, uh, oh, a woe oh is God. me. But like, from a store's perspective, it kind of makes me pissed knowing that these sets just aren't good from any other per like for any other person yeah i mean like it only helps bandai which i mean in their business standpoint they don't care at the end of the day um they really don't care if they screw us over a hundred times over yeah they'll um, say they're sorry and move <clears throat> on so people trying to like chill for bandai that's a little weird i don't understand that you're the players do you matter more than bandai in regards to the business or the player base and that kind of stuff so i don't understand that mentality but i also am on the the front end where like me and you for example we, we're gonna buy just because we're we're trying to play competitively and things of that nature right so and like there's... we had to kind of buy early just to make sure we could try to get our cards in a timely matter like i don't even think i'm getting some of the cards in time for ultimate cup which to me is kind of what pisses me off a little bit more is that like that sucks it yeah. really sucks i'd have to see some of the tracking on some of the packages but i don't think i'm getting all <clears> the cards in time uh so like and that was me buying technically day one like 24 hours from the midnight release uh yeah so like, like what normal people most normal people would have done the night of release they would have looked on the t would have hopped on their tcg player and they would have bought most normal people would have done that, and then they would have been a lot of more often than not they would have been screwed because the prices were so fluctuating so horrendously. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. like a lot of people say, don't buy pre pre order or pre sale prices, and that sentiment there, is true. It's it's very true. Like some of the cards I were hate just <laughs> they were just so be able to they were so high for like zero reason because they can control the secondary market and then the really unfortunate part is the 
I'm the people who do buy into the pre-orders, they're actually only hurting everyone else and themselves included. So like it it actually is in everyone's best interest to not to avoid it. Yes, to, to avoid, avoid it. Like the plate. Because then you're setting the base price and demand for what the card is worth. And then people obviously don't want to give up any more money than they have to when it comes to what a card is worth. So the fact that you're buying so early, setting that base price, and now people see that base price and they want that same price too. But people are going to have to undercut and they they just don't want to let go. And that's, that's part of like part of the problem is pre-orders like the pre-order culture the FOMO you're going to get your cards it they're going to be way less than pre-order prices just because the floodgates will be open there will be more sellers and you're not going to get the card any sooner than if you bought it like day one like it it pre-order just means you pay it still gets shipped the day of you don't get them earlier so it's like it makes it almost makes no sense to buy no, it's just oh. the stores that are able to take advantage do. Like, that. that's all it is. <laughs> PPG has zero qualms charging somebody $15 for a super rare, uh, like a bulk super rare, and then, and then on the release day, day, charging $2 for it. Like, they yeah, have they zero issues with it. From, from a business standpoint, they don't care. They're making yeah, money. Make, they'll make their money where they can. And we... You can't as, fault them for it because people are buying it. Yeah, and we as a community need to kind of just stop with pre-orders. Um, and like It shouldn't be allowed, but it is. Uh, you just need to be smart. Yeah, and even the set's price, like the price of boxes kind of also should tell you like if a set is popular or not. Like this Shit is $72, bro. Like, this box, Exceed Apocalypse, $72. That's how much they're going on TCG Player right now. And the big tell is how much is a box of, let's just say, BT14 going for. Uh, Because that's like a good baseline where it's just like you have two sets back to back competing. So uh, BT14 is a little bit more expensive, uh, but we also are only one week into uh, BT15's life. Uh, So So this will be the highest it probably will be. Yeah, BT14 right now is selling for like $78. Animal Coliseum is currently 61 So that's, sh- again, that kind of tells you like, okay, BT14 is more popular than EX5, Animal Coliseum. And then even if you look at the Resurgence Booster, Resurgence Booster is like almost $35. It's 37 right now. That, that, again, tells you, like, okay, what kind of is a good set? What kind of makes these worth it? And, like, there's there's a lot that a box price tells you as a consumer in terms of what to what you would want. Uh, so a box of Across Time is about 70, um, just as it's just more frame of reference. If we go back a year ago... Yeah, we could see Dimensional Phase BT11 is currently like 85. And that, again, is because there's less stock, it's out of print, it's not readily available, and the cards are, for the most part, climbing because some of them are just harder to get. So that creates more drive for the set. Uh, And and certain cards are getting uh, updates in the set as well. So like... Uh, Galactimon got its promo so that put potential uh, pressure on that card in terms of the demand for it Mm -hmm. and same thing Mm -hmm. with a lot of the Angelomon and Lady Devi stuff that uh, for Mastemon teases for leaks and stuff like that so people want to get their hands on like Mirai and all these other cards Um... yeah I have a whole video kind of like going over the, the Digimon uh, market hype trends if anyone's interested in watching that it's it's a solid video that goes over just the general flow but i do think with that flow that's based on the fact that we know what's coming out in japan and i think like next year is going to be a really important yeah, year pretty fun yeah next year the unification is probably going to be the most important year in digimon's history in terms of the the trading card game that we have uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, 
that's going to be its fifth year. So the five-year curse is a known thing where most TCGs fail before they hit five years. So that's going to be definitely a thing. Um, I don't think we're going to be that afraid of dying. We're, we're nowhere near dying. Um, nah, the game's doing pretty well. But that that is something outsiders look at, is did this game survive the five-year curse? Um, that That is something people do look at, because you just recently had MetaZoo die. Uh, that didn't make it to its five years, so it fell into that five-year curse spectrum. That game had a mm -hmm. whole slew of different problems that Digimon just doesn't really have. Digimon has other problems. Yeah, I mean, no game will be perfect, but being able to mitigate the problems that can be mitigated, it, it, the, like some of these problems are simple fixes. Like, not hard for them to do. Yeah, like, Bandai um, just needs to not mess with card pull rates based on what we're familiar with. That's big <clears throat> number one. <laughs> that's very simple. <laughs> right. It's not, a, it's not a hard concept to get around. No, and um, they do it well... Uh, they they do it once every year and it just pisses everyone off all the time and that's why we always say oh this was the worst set uh like it there's no real right or wrong answer in terms of what is or isn't the worst set because that's person to person i think rb1 is way worse than this ever was um oh yeah as a set as a set as a whole 100 percent. i i think uh i don't think that's can be argued. It's one of those things that's very hard to argue. Yeah, like when my store came up <clears> to me and was just like, hey, we got a whole bunch of RB1 we can't sell. Do you want it for like at cost? And I was just like, how much is at cost? And they're just like, $40. I was like taken back and I was looking at TCG Player and I'm like, oh, yeah, these boxes are going for at forty dollars that means everyone is selling it at cost or below cost just to get rid of it because there's just too much of it stores don't want it players after a certain point just don't want it i think it's a little bit better now because there is some artificial value into yeah, the it Monzimon stuff and yeah you have the Monzimon rare and you have in terms of a secret rare that's been climbing you have omnimon's work defeat because people really just want to force dark masters to work and omnimon's work defeat is the next best card for that deck because the dark masters can digivolve on top of omni or into white digimon and omnimon's are white and that one could just come for free out of security so it makes sense why people would want that one yeah, I mean, there's there's a few cards in this set, though. I, yeah, like, RB1's not, that. like, that bad, but in terms of pull rates and pull feel, that's what we're getting that's awful. at. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's $36 for a reason. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> like, no one wants these cards. Like, no, or no one wants to try and pull for them. Yeah, I think like, there was just too many bad reprints that just mucked up the things. They, again, they had special seeding, <clears throat> which made things worse, not better. Whereas BT15 didn't have any special seeding, so it was kind of fine. And the funny thing was, like, people all the way back in BT11, they were championing the fact that we finally get foil commons. Well, the worst there, thing to do. Yeah, that, that was, uh, that turned out to be pretty bad for us because they took away our rares in replace of those foil commons and foil uncommons. And then you look at BT15. And the LM cards are all foil. So Bandai could easily just make whatever they want foil. Like they could just say, okay, here is one foil common out of the pack. Just whatever. <laughs> a random yeah. foil, a random card is going to be foil. Like they could, they could do that. They just literally prove that they can do that. So I'm like, it's not like it's that difficult. It, it, it There's no way it's that cost effect, like that costly for them to just say, they want to do something like that. Put a separate pack, add like two or three cards into the pack if they want to do that. And then it's just a random common, uncommon foil if they want that. Just don't put it in the set. Don't mess with the set cards. Like the initial 
uh, values of like the specific cards. Like we should see the same amount every set so that there's no discrepancies. So like, what with getting cards? Yes. So what I think Bandai should have done to be able to remedy this entire situation spanning basically six months at this point because of RB1 all the way up to now, uh, there was just a lot of just crap. <laughs> like just crappy like sets and business tactics and pull rates and all that stuff. It just, this was not a good six months, like pull wise, like box opener wise. And I think what they should have done at the end of the day was they should have just took all of the RB one cards, all of the LM cards made it a like what 50 card set. And then if they wanted to really buff it out to make it EX size, I'm pretty sure they had 20 promos that they were sitting on doing absolutely nothing with, and they could have thrown in. them in. Like it, it would not have mattered there, and everyone would have been okay because then it also would have artificially increased the value of the set. And it just, it, 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 there's no reason not to. Like things like that, like simple fixes like that would do, would go for miles, would miles help the game. Yeah, and if they really wanted to, they could have just assigned fake rarities to some of the promo cards just for box seating yeah. purposes. So it's just like, oh, yeah. Add an they... extra card to the slot. LM slot. Boom. Instead of taking a card, I'll just add the extra. Well, no. So, like, in terms of, like, turning uh, RB1 LM 01 and then <clears throat> missing promos into an actual set, that, like, to make it feel like yeah. a EX set. That would have been, been cool. Uh, I that's what I feel like they should have done. It would have created a whole nother product that they would have had to create the designs for, create a selling pitch for, uh, do all the rigmarole. And I think they just didn't want to do that because they didn't do that for Japan. And a lot of the stuff is kind of just copy pasted. Uh, once you do it once, once you have that design, they just reuse just it for the change other the English and slap it in or whatever languages that are and then slap it on. Continue. Yeah. So I think they just didn't want to bother doing that, even though they should have. But like when it comes to making that into its own fake EX set, uh, they would have probably had to, like I said, fake rarities where it's just like Raremon. Uh, he could have been a fake SR. So in our normal packs, how they're seated, he could have just taken up the pull rate of what an SR would have been. They don't have to disclose it, but they could have done it that way anyway, where it's just, or yeah, they, they could, or they could have just done foiled like versions where it's just like, okay, uh, we know there's less general SRs in this set. So instead that slot is going to be a foil promo or whatever. Like there's, there's ways and tactics they could have done to flesh it out if that was the approach that they wanted to. But nope. Uh, instead, they were just like, let's just throw shit into another set and call it a day. And that ended up being the uh, worst possible decision from a consumer base. Totally. Yeah, it was the worst decision that could have been done. <laughs> but in Next. terms... Yeah, Oops, but right. in terms of the secondary market, we still got a lot of time with the set. Uh, the next set's not coming out until May. Yeah, I think May. Yeah, because we get it's... the starter deck or the advanced deck in March, so we're gonna have quite some time with the set. I think the meta is gonna be pretty interesting because we're entering this unknown territory. Uh, so there's a lot of possibility on the table, and I think that's gonna be the fun part of the set. Not necessarily the set itself or to open the set, but uh, the result of what is coming out in March in the ban and restriction update and the, the starter deck. Yeah, I'm excited. This is going to be fun. And it's it's May 24th when BT16 comes out. So we got a good amount of time. We got literally three months. Three months to experiment, uh, chart these uncharted waters that we're in because uh there's a lot of things that changed come march 1st a lot of things are going to change that japan did not have access to there's even a lot the of market cards could that change did. that too you're right like these uh, two weeks are going to be the most volatile because everyone's trying to figure out what the heck they <clears> want <throat> and what the heck they need not only just for the events that are happening in march forward but also looking at 
all of the Japanese spoilers. Yeah, there's a lot of things. I mean, we're going to be constantly having spoilers, so there will be random market spikes here and there. That's just is how it is until we get the unification. Uh, the game will just... Our side of the woods, at least, will be that way for a little while. Um, so bear with it. We got about a, a little under a year until supposedly that happens. We will see if we get to that point. It's supposed to go that way, but we will see. Uh, what happens um, but I am very excited uh, even amongst all this with this set just to see what happens what people come up with what people fall to as their uh, quote unquote best deck um, if there even will be one which I mean there will be but it just depends um, the tug and pull I'm very excited for that I think this bet will be a lot of tug and pull rather than a singular deck is going to be just better than the rest. Well, yeah, because everything basically is going to have to prove itself all over again in terms of exactly. the meta wise. But I know, so excited. Like, I know we're all disappointed with the way box wise BT15 played mm -hmm. out. Uh, I think that's like unanimous across the board. Nobody's arguing that the set was like that mm -hmm. great. Uh, some people are like, yeah, I bought so few where it kind of just didn't matter to me. So I was happy with it regardless. Like you'll get those people. But for the most part, I know the sentiment across the community was overly negative when it came to the set, not necessarily because of the ban and restriction announcement, but because I think the set just wasn't one that was going to be highly sought after anyway. Like it has some good stuff, but it's not anything like jaw-droppingly powerful that needs to be and apocalypse was supposed to be that but without him it really kind of shows and proves that there was no driving force for the set quantumon was the next best thing and obviously based on quantumon and gurumon's price being exactly the same and the card's price continuously decreasing uh it really shows that there's actually not that much hype around those cards at all so those aren't doing it but I think that the like people who want Digimon to be a money game, it's not going to be. And I know people are like really upset because they're trying to play this like little investor game into Digimon and they're losing because work. they're not reading things properly. Um, and even if you read things properly, I think you were still destined to pretty much lose on this set regardless. And... Like, that's where I get, like, a little bit angry from a store level because, like, it just, it doesn't feel good to want to continuously buy these products. Even though, like, your players might be there, uh, just from a store perspective, there there just isn't money in it. Yeah, the and, stuff sits. And I think, like, stores, like, this is partially a selfish player thing. I think stores also need to do better job researching into how to make the most out of what they have because i i'm gonna openly be honest i hate spending 80 90 dollars on a booster box for the digimon tcg like i look at tcg player prices and i see like an average of 75 dollars is the going price for usually a new box and when i see stores not just my main lgs but stores in general charge more than that it makes me not want to get the the product at all and just buy singles instead and that's not the that's not the mentality you would want out of a game you want to have players buy their booster boxes and when bandai does stuff like this when they do stuff like lm or rb1 when they do stuff like ex sets it really doesn't make stores want to buy into the game and that's very unfortunate and it seems like they're trying to figure out how to do it but I think Digimon's just not a game designed to be a money game, and that's fine. Stores just have to adjust accordingly, and I'm not saying stores need to sell at cost or whatever. I'm just saying stores need to stop being super greedy to try to make their profits as high as they possibly can. Like, okay, what's a $25 or what's a $20 hit? From selling a box at $95 versus $75. You're making the player happy. You're moving the product. You're still making money. It's just not $20 more money. You're not making 100% profit. Right. Like 100% 100, 100 more profit. Like it's 
Like, I get, you know, like, it's a business for them. And a lot of times they're not players. A lot of card owner shop owners are not players. They're kind of just card shop owners. Um, sometimes, you know, it's good if they are players and then they kind of understand markets and things like that. Uh, or they're just card o- shop owners and they just go around and they look through all the markets and buy cards and they understand from that perspective. But it it sucks that that's... That of course, it's just it, it is the it is the nature of the beast. It's a business for them. They don't, they they they. It's not their prerogative to care about us, um, which does suck. But it does bring loyal customers when you do show care, when you do things like charge, not necessarily at value like fifty bucks or something stupid like that. That's dumb. Like of course they're not going to do that, but you know, reasonably charge up. Like you could. Do it at 70 at the normal price of these boxes that are going on that because there's there's no reason not to you know what i mean like yeah just make to your keep customer people happy. going yeah keep people coming why would you not want that and i guess it's because people will buy this stuff anyway so they don't they don't care that or they just honestly they just don't care like digimon is just one of those games they don't care that much about uh so they just get the product just because people ask for it and then they move on with their day. And that's unfortunate, but it also is just, you know, kind of kind of how it is, um, which does suck for us as players. Um, and I don't quite know how to fix that beyond just getting your group of players and really going to a shop owner and talking to them and like, really getting to know them because i'm lucky that i have gone to my shops around me and they're all at least the two that i go to to buy product are great and they work with me with pricing and things like that because i do tend to buy a lot (laughs) so they're they're flexible and they're willing to do those deals that are are good for me but that's not the case for everyone Um, and that's a very a rare example where that doesn't happen too often. So I I feel very bad for the people that do have to just say, screw it, I gotta go. Like, I have a local around here that charges, like, like these boxes were like $90 a pop. And I'm like, yeah, you guys are on, you guys are crazy. Um, and I'm like, it, that is crazy that people were charging $90 for this box, BT-15. Like, that is bonkers. It, even just it, any box ugh. it actually bugs me that they can do that and people will buy them because there's some maybe they don't know there are other shops in the area or they don't care and they just want to support that shop um i think that's it sucks because you want to support your local shop you want to because you want to that's you want to be able to just say oh i'm gonna go pick up a box of cards today like the ideal scenario is i wake up february 16th i go to my local store and they're selling the boxes for 75 dollars a pop that would be like ideal scenario like because that's like normal price that's like normal that would be okay based on like the market trends on a lot of the booster boxes like 70 to 75 is just generally what they actually go for at least online. And granted, I do know there's like uh, ghost retailers where they're just only online shops. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I do know ghost retailers like that actually do hurt LGSs because they can lower the price. But again, because they don't have the, the store fees uh, and they don't have to pay a landlord or anything like they could get away with selling them for less profit. But at the same time, us as a community... We do have the lines in the sand on what we're drawing as far as what's okay and what's not okay. And I think what Bandai did to this set was just straight up not okay. And it does make me very fearful for the unification sets, which is going to be uh, BT 18, 19, and 20. Because there's going to be an EX set in between there somewhere. On top of the fact that... uh, 
that's going to be a combined set like Special Booster 1.0 and 1.5. And one of those sets was obviously better handled than the other. And based on Bandai's recent combination like sets, at least for the English game, because I know they've been combining sets in China for a while. I don't know how China's been receiving those sets, but it's not like they have a choice. But regardless, it makes me very wary on the unification sets. And then I think once we get past that unification and we are on equal playing fields, I, I do feel like the game is going to get a lot better. We have a lot of sets that are going to be insanely hyped up for. And I'm just hoping Bandai doesn't try to do anything funny or silly with them. Um, and I do hope Bandai for this year also catches us up on promos because we're still behind on promos. We still are missing some of them. It's laughably sad at this point, but the cards are like so past their prime. It's like, do we even need them? Like, it's, it's such no, a they, they might as well we just want throw them, them at sure. us. Like, because there's no Ooh. value in them, they might as well just hand us them. Like do, do the, uh, uh, the god i'm blanking the training cards just give yeah, us just one of one every of one. yeah just give us one of everything like please just stop making your promos so bad <clears throat> especially when half of them are outdated by the time we get them or if they're four casual decks that are just making them more expensive for no reason because they're harder to get like i get you want the game to be in a better state from a financial aspect but uh, Bandai also needs to make it worth it for stores and for players to want the sets and what they've done with the past couple outside of BT14 really hasn't been doing it. No, uh, I, I'm, I'm very much against <laughs> what has been happening with these sets. Um, I would much prefer if we, uh, find an alternate solution because I'm not having fun um, getting product. And that's kind of, you know, one of my favorite parts of this game, just opening product with friends and all that other shenanigans. And then now you're putting me in position to where I don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to go out of my way to get product because it's not fun to open. Why? Like it's not, I mean that's that's why I stopped buying cases is literally for that reason like financially it just wasn't worth it because my store was charging me too much <clears throat> and even financially taking that part out of it uh like it just it wasn't really conducive for me to do it anymore so that's partially why I stopped buying cases of sets is because it just wasn't fun I wasn't enjoying it I I do like having all of the bulk to be able to just build whatever the heck that I want, but not that I paid so much that it was harming me uh, financially to be able to support the game that way. Um, so, I mean, if the band I made it more worth my while, then sure, yeah, I'll go back to buying cases. But right now, like if I bought a case on this set, I'd be losing been, so hard. You would have been screwed. I would have been so screwed it wouldn't even have been funny. Um, Unless you sold day one. Yeah, or, like, or pre-sale. Yeah, like, that would have been the only time you got your case early and you pre-sailed. That's the only way you would have surplused. But, or at least broke even. Yeah, but I know usually when talking about the market, it's always going to be negative. Even the good stuff is still kind of negative. So, like, I do think the meta to come is going to be a really good meta. And I think that we have a lot of hype and excitement to look forward to out of what's to come this year, not only just for events, uh, which that's a whole nother topic in of itself, but um, from the sets that are coming out, the themes, like they're, they're hitting a lot of notes to really excite people. And I want to see that level of attention continue throughout the year and go into next year and make next year the strongest year ever i'm beyond excited i do think we're gonna get to that point where this the game will be like you say where we want it to be the strongest it can be uh and we just need to be a little bit patient uh go through the grinder we're almost there where 
when we get that unification, assuming that they handle everything correctly, not necessarily correctly, but they do it fairly, it should be a good time. And this set coming up is going to be, I'm so excited for it because just uncharted territory. There's no, oh, I'm going to look at what uh, these decks from this. We don't know. We You have no clue. It could be great. Could be worse. We don't know. That's yeah, why I'm so excited for that. Let's just hope Bandai actually learns from this and really starts toning down their designs because yeah, the no last couple of month, please. Yeah, because the last couple of sets, they it's not necessarily intentional power creep. Uh part of it is probably, but not <laughs> all of it. It's just some negligence. It it feels like design negligence where they just didn't think these through very well. And that's why it created this like broken cycle. And I think like BT 16 obviously shows based on all of the Japanese spoilers that looks they good. Yeah. Looks not, good. Not. There's a lot of checks and balances in play from <sighs> the game's standpoint. And hopefully they can continue that trend rather <clears throat> than the Apocaly Anubis trend where it really just damages the set's overall drive and interest and really harms everyone involved except for Bandai. They could say that it harms them, and it kind of does. It harms them for the future, not for the now, which Bandai is definitely smart enough of a business to know what their future looks like, especially since they have stores order so far in advance. Yeah, they don't, they don't care. They're like at the end of the day it's unfortunate that they don't care about us in that regard but they do and they don't let me not say that because they do care because they have we have they were the ones buying the product right we're uh, supporting them not the other way around but they don't care in regards to what happens after the product is gone like once they've got it it's just like well up to them figure it out and then it kind of just sucks for us but um we can hope for the best and going forward I, I always like looking at things in a positive outlook in regards to this because there is a lot of positive going to happen we just unfortunately have to wait for it and i think even though like if you're looking at the market there there will always be negatives and positives like there's nothing you could do about the market for the most part at least the only thing i you can do is hold your money talk speak with your money like don't buy pre-sales don't Things look fishy, just don't do it. Just if that's the rule of thumb. Um, the only time that I guess you could quote unquote just shotgun stuff like that is like, for example, like me trying to play in these Ultimate Cups this weekend. Some of the stuff, like, I mean, I got lucky and I just happened to buy all the stuff dramatically cheaper than what it was worth uh, at that moment. But a lot of people didn't have that lucky because they were just like, well, I got to get the cards, Ultimate Cups this weekend. And. They shotgun bought a bunch of stuff and now they're hurting, at least in terms of value, if they care. Um, a lot of people don't honestly care. There's a lot of people that just buy the stuff and they're just like, I got my cards, I'm good. And they'll move on and they won't ever think about it. Um, I'm kind of on that boat because no matter what, I'm going to play with the cards. So it, it kind of doesn't matter to me if I spend the money on them. But it um, it's, it's a weird tug and pull. But overall... I'm quite happy, um, even though the set isn't the greatest. Um, I'm happy for what the set is going to be. Yeah, that's where I would. That's the at the end of the day, that's kind of the as a player at least. That's what should matter the most to you. What's going to happen with the meta? And I can only see good things at the moment, right now. So speaking of the meta, let's try to end on a little bit more of a positive note. Ultimate Cup is coming up. So what are you looking at playing in Ultimate Cup? Shotgun me three decks that you're uh, you're looking at playing. Okay. I know this is the unrestricted version of BT15. This is the only event that's going to be unrestricted. So Correct. like, are you going to be the one to play Apocaly? at full power <laughs> i am not i'll go ahead and throw that out there if you do see me you will not see me playing a box one uh you I, I will not fault you for playing it why would you not it is it undoubtedly would be the best deck um so 
shotgun. I'm down to see all you Apocalypse players. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to run through the gauntlet. But um, three decks that I think I'm definitely looking at playing right now. I'm looking at Bloom Lord. I've been playing a lot, and it does really well into a lot of stuff. Quantumon is amazing. Um, I am playing... I've been playing a lot of Numemon. And Numemon Rush. That thing is crazy. Some crazy, crazy things you can do with it. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun playing it. And that honestly matters to me more than most of the stuff. Um, and then another deck to round out would be probably Mirage Galgamon. Those would be the three decks that I'm thinking of piloting and bringing to uh, the regional. Or not regional, um, Ultimate Cup this weekend. I think all three of those decks do fairly well into a good number of decks. And they inherently don't have flaws other than themselves, for the most part. So, I like that a lot. It basically, there's a lot of skill expression. Uh, aside from, like, maybe, you can quote-unquote say Mirage doesn't have a lot of skill expression. But um, the other two decks, I think, are awesome and if you pilot them amazing, like if you pilot them well, you are rewarded very well for that. So I'm very excited to uh, give it my all come this uh, set. Because this uh, this year I'm going crazy. I'm getting my number one at a regional somewhere. I don't know where, but you will see my name on number one. Yeah, with uh, invites <clears throat> going back to just being invites, uh, I'm definitely going to be trying as hard as I possibly can. I do kind of want to try a little bit on the harder side with ultimate cups as well, since we don't have any kooky, wacky, silly rule shenanigans that are making me not want to play it. Uh, the so it's good. I'm so, you, but I like that pricing. Uh, I I'm impressed with the pricing as well. So m the three decks that I'm thinking about, I'm going to be brutally honest. One of them is Apocalypse, and yeah. Yeah, I know. Shocker. Uh, that's why I'm like hoping my cards get in in time is so that I can have my Apocalypse to play uh, because I could just transition the Dark Master deck to do something else afterward with all of the Omnimons and play it like a Mega Zoo style. But yeah. uh, so it's not like me building the deck is like worth not worth my time. I, I would do it, especially for Ultimate Cup, because the prizing seems pretty solid. Uh, so one of the decks I'm thinking about is Apocalypse. Another one I'm thinking about is Mirage as well, just because, like you said, I don't really need to change anything. Mirage is still absolutely insane. And I actually got a buff this set too. Technically, yeah. Uh, and the last deck that I'm looking at is I'm torn between either Melga or um, Fenry. <laughs> But Ooh. I think I'm leaning more towards Melga than Fenry, just because this is unrestricted <clears throat> Melga. So, and I already have, like, the deck mostly built. I just have to throw back in the uh, the going-to-be-limited X antibodies. And then, again, I'm kind of hoping I get my cards in time so I could get my Metal Garurumons, and then I'm good to go. Like, that's why I'm like, I had to buy day one so I could get yeah, some of the cards and... Have. Yeah, and then that can help determine what I'm going to play based on what I can get in time. So I'm cutting it real close, but those those yes, are the decks are. that I'm looking at. <laughs> you are cutting it very close. <laughs> it's not my like fault right they there. chose to ship it That's now. True. They could have shipped it over on Saturday or Sunday, but no. A lot of the places chose now, like today, to ship it or send me the the uh, notice. Or, I'm going to uh, give a tracking. random fourth deck. Because I've just been playing it a lot, and Yellow Vaccine is uh, another one that I'm tempted to uh, pull up with. Come for some of these tournaments, because um, just throwing that deck out because I just love it. It's just super fun, and there's some pretty degenerate things you can do. Yeah. So, Ultimate Cup will be fun. BT15's meta post this Ultimate Cup is gonna be fun. Um. I hopefully we have the data by then. I'm not holding my breath because Eggman's the one who usually does all the data and he is absolutely so whomped with Bandai stuff because uh, Dragon Ball Fusion Dragon World Ball. just came out on top of 
uh, One Piece having a lot of stuff that he's already doing on top of Digimon, on top of... I don't even know if he's, like, really supporting Dragon Ball Super Masters anymore. Um, I don't think so. He he gets the data and throws it up on his website, but I haven't seen him do anything with Masters in a while. I think he's more hyped for Fusion World uh, based on his website. That's fair. Uh, I have been enjoying the game, so I can't say... I'll I'll That's try the client better. when it comes out. Um, the lo- my locals for Bandai stuff is usually Dragon Ball heavy. I'm not gonna be actually buying product. Uh, I'll I'll spoil that right now. I'll be the dirty free to play player who gets absolutely nowhere because I don't play the game enough. And yeah, it'll it'll be interesting. That is very fair. <laughs> but I I just really hope that uh that Eggman can at least get the ultimate cup data in time. So that way we could actually have it for next week. If not, we're probably just going to be talking about what is to come and what we're expecting out of the meta that is going to be under the restrictions, uh, which is technically going to be the world's format. So that will definitely be an interesting thing to see how the meta evolves from the one ultimate cup into what the meta is going to be post ultimate cup oh interesting i'm so excited this is gonna be such a good time honestly uh, i am too i just like playing so uh, exactly so with that i want to thank everyone for listening all the way till the end it really does mean the world to us that you made it this far Uh, If you enjoyed this episode and want to help support the podcast, please make sure to share it with others on social media so that way we could get kind of it trending. Uh, Just more eyes and more ears always helps uh, in any way, shape, or form on top of all of the general social media stuff like following, subscribing, liking, and whatnot. And I want to thank everyone again for watching the episode, and we will see you next time.